All righty. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to our webinar. Um, this week, we're going to be talking about uh, some of the internals and the architecture of Cockroach DB. But before I get started, let me just uh, do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, first of all, uh, th again, thank you for joining. Um, number one, if there's any questions along the way, um, please do ask them in the QA panel, um, the QA panel of, the, of Zoom there. Um, I'll be monitoring those along the way, uh, and, and I'll pick those off and, and, and lob those into our, our main speaker, Peter, here. Um, but please do that. Um, and then at the, end of the, at the end of the webinar, we'd like to, uh, I, I, Charlotte will put a, a, a link to a survey. So we'd love your feedback so we can actually make these things better. And then finally, before us, a recording will be available after the event. Um, we're looking forward to get that recording out to everybody. So, so thank you for joining. Um, my name is Jim Walker. I, am, uh, I do product marketing here at Cockroach Labs, and I am proud and honored to have uh, our co-founder and CTO, Peter Mattis, join us. Good morning, Pete. Hello, everyone. Um, and Peter's going to talk about, again, some of the, the internal architecture of CockroachDB and how a distributed SQL database works. So. And over to you, buddy. All right. Thanks, Jim. All right. So I want to just today I'm going to talk about some of the larger architectural components of Cockroach DB. And this is really kind of an engineer's uh, webinar. Um, it's not marketing about why you should use Cockroach DB, it's about how Cockroach DB is internally structured. Um, I'm going to at times dive down into details. I'm going to kind of cover the major components. But Cockroach DB is a large and complex system, and it's necessarily going to be something of a whirlwind tour. I'm not going to be able to cover everything in depth. Uh, hopefully, you're going to leave today. You're going to have a better understanding of some of the internal workings of a distributed SQL database. Um, before I get, dive into this, I kind of wanted to give you a, a little bit of a marketing pitch, um, the three, three word pitch for Cockroach DB, and that is make data easy. This is actually our mission statement. Uh, our thesis is that too much burden. Um, has been placed on application developers. SQL, database SQL databases, historically, they did not provide horizontal scalability or geo-distribution capabilities that modern applications need. Uh, no SQL databases promised that horizontal scalability, but in order to get it, you had to give up nice things like transactions and indexes and other functionality that makes building applications easy. And that placed a significant burden on app developers. So uh, in that landscape, we stepped in and we're trying to provide the best of both worlds with Cockroach TV, um, making it easy, make it easy to distribute it horizontally, make it easy to do geo distribution and providing um, SQL uh, as the, the language to interface with the system. All right, here's the agenda for the webinar. Uh, there's a lot to cover here, so I'm just gonna dive right in. And where I'm gonna start I'm going to start at the bottom. There's a lot of places you could dive into the architecture of Cockroach DB. I'm going to start at the bottom. So the bottom layer of Cockroach DB is a distributed, replicated, transactional key value store. And I kind of want to just, you know, point out the little asterisk there. Uh, this distributed, replicated, transactional key value store is internal to Cockroach DB. It's not exposed for external usage. And there's a variety of reasons for this. Um, but kind of the high level uh, argument is that we want to focus all our energies on making the SQL interface that we do exposed the best possible. And that means that we want the flexibility to e um, evolve this transactional key value store uh, rapidly. Uh, so there's a lot of buzzwords in distributed replicated transactional key value store. I'm going to touch on all of them. Um, so the first thing to note uh, about a distributed replicated transactional key value store is it holds keys and values. And keys and values are both arbitrary strings at this level. Um, later on, I'll descri describe some of the structure that we impose upon them, but the lowest level, they're just arbitrary strings. Uh, Cockroach DB uses something called multi-version concurrency control. I'm not going to talk about that much today. You can database implementations. Um, the values, they're versioned. Uh, we use a hybrid logical clock scheme. Um, values are in MVCC implementations. Values are never updated in place. Instead, new versions shadow older versions. And something called a tombstone is used to delete values. Uh, the purpose of MVCC is that it allows us to provide transactions kind of a read-only snapshot. So each um, transaction sees kind of consistent snapshot of the database. Uh, the key space is monolithic, and I'm going to touch into that, what I mean by monolithic right now. So by monolithic key space, I mean, there's not any sort of partitioning or namespace. All the keys 
just kind of exist in the same space. Uh, this space is ordered by key. Now, note on this slide and a lot of the slides that follow, um, I'm just going to be showing keys here, not values. I'm not going to be showing how uh, the, the records are versioned. Um, this is just done in pursuit of clarity. Uh, the reality of the system is more complicated behind the scenes. So the ordered monolithic key space, this is logical. Um, physically, this is realized by dividing the, the key space into ranges. And these ranges are approximately 64 megabytes in size. And I'll note that 64 megabytes isn't a uh, kind of a, a fixed size. Ranges grow and shrink dynamically. Um, the reason we chose 64 megabytes is it's a size that uh, we can move ranges around quickly but it's large enough to amortize some of the indexing overhead for ranges. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the indexing um, in a slide or two. So as I said, ranges grow dynamically. They start empty, um, they grow, and they split when they get too large. And they also can shrink if values are deleted, uh, keys are deleted from them and merge with their neighbors when they get too small. Uh, kind of conceptually, CockroachDB starts with just a single range in the cluster, and that range is split repeatedly over and over and over again until you have thousands of ranges in a cluster. Uh, data is placed into ranges using what we call an order-preserving data distribution. And you can see this in this slide. Well, we have this table of dog names, and the dogs are uh, ordered lexicographically. You know, they're sorted in a sorted order. Uh, so Carl comes before Dagny, comes before Figment, comes before Jack. Um, this is an extremely important design point. Uh, we could have used something like a consistent hashing scheme. We do not. Other systems do. Something like Cassandra uses consistent hashing. We were unable to do this because we wanted to implement full SQL. In order to implement full SQL, you essentially need um, this order preserving data distribution. And I'll talk about that in just a, a slide or two to show you why. <clears throat> So in order to maintain the ordering between ranges, on top of the ranges. So here we have our three ranges and there's an indexing structure that points to all the ranges. So we can see that the indexing structure says that all the keys between Carl and Jack, they're in the first range. All the keys between Lady and Petey, they're in the, the second range, et cetera. And this kind of, if you squint, kind of looks like a distributed B tree. Uh, this structure isn't unique to CockroachDB. Um, it's following the footsteps of other systems. This two-level indexing scheme is also used by Bigtable and HBase and Spanner. Um, something to note here, and I don't describe on this slide, is that we, we have to be able to find this indexing structure and how to locate this indexing structure. And the indexing structure is kind of recursively stored inside the key space as well. Um, and you're probably thinking, hey, there's a little chicken and egg problem. How do I find out where the indexing structure is? And the solution to that is that the indexing structure is itself indexed by the very first range in the system. And that first range has a, a well-known location and it becomes the root of all the data in the Cockroach DB cluster. So I was talking about how uh, all the data is ordered and why you want to have it ordered. And that's in order to have efficient range scans. So if you have a query and you want to find all the dogs with names between Muddy and Stella, that actually covers two ranges. And the indexing structure allows us to find those ranges efficiently. So here we're showing that, you know, you can see logically that Muddy and Stella are all contiguous in the dogs table. And it's actually split across two ranges here, ranges two and three. Uh, updates to the transactional Distributed key value store are transactional themselves. Um, transactions are used to insert records into ranges. Um, here I'm showing what would happen if we tried to insert the key Sunny um, into the system. And we go into the indexing structure. That directs us to the correct range. We see if there's space available. And if there is, we insert the key Sunny into that third range. <clears throat> now, if we try to insert another key, in this case, Rudy, and it also gets directed to the third range, and we see space isn't available, we end up having to split the range. And this, the, the, the split operation, it has to update the indexing structure, and this is also a distributed transaction. So that same transactional uh, uh, update mechanism that takes place for the user data also takes place for our internal metadata. And if I'm, if I'm right or wrong, Peter, this doesn't happen in real time, right? Yeah, so 
th this is kind of the description I'm giving in the slides because it's kind of like an, an easy conceptual version, but there's actually not a fixed size to ranges. So what happens in practice is that the key gets added to the range and then asynchronously we split it when it's um, oversized. So we let the range go a little bit far and then for performance reasons, we don't have to do the split while a transaction's happening. Yeah. We can just do it later, right? You do it later. Yeah, cool. um, there is a little bit of additional mechanism that takes place there, which is back pressure mechanism. So when a range gets really far beyond what its intended size is, we start back pressuring yeah. the user rights. Um, that rarely kicks in unless you have a particular workload that's just hammering a, a single range. Cool. All right. So I talked about um, transactions at a high level. I talked a little bit about distribution. Now it's time to talk about replication. Uh, for replication, CockroachDB uses Raft. Uh, Raft is a distributed consensus algorithm similar to Paxos. Um, if any of you have heard of Paxos, you probably uh, also heard that it's notoriously difficult to implement. I would attribute a lot of that to some of the early descriptions of Paxos, which were a little bit opaque. Um, Raft was intentionally designed to be easier to understand, though kind of my experience having worked with it over the past five years is it's not any easier to implement when you get to the implementation level. Fundamentally, both Raft and Paxos are distributed consensus algorithms. Um, and kind of recent research in this area kind of highlighted how there's a whole family of consensus algorithms with Pax and Paxos and Raft simply occupying different points on the, the spectrum of possibilities. So how does CockroachDB use Raft? Each range, each 64 megabyte range is a Raft group. And I'm going to reiterate this because it's a frequent source of confusion. We do not replicate at the node level. We replicate at the range level. So we have all this flexibility in terms of where the, the replicas of a range go. Um, we get fine grain control over data placement. And we also get to control the replication factor on a per range basis. So we don't actually expose um, that ability uh, to administrators of the cluster. But what we do allow you to do is control the replication factor on a table basis and on an index basis. And there's even a, a, a subgrouping below table and indexes, which is uh, partitions of tables. You can control the replication factor there. <clears throat> so <clears throat> one of the neat things uh, about a distributed consensus protocol is that it provides this uh, fundamental operation, which is um, atomic replication of commands. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit later about how the, this atomic replication comes into play. But this is kind of this um, fundamental ability that, uh, that consensus protocols uh, provide. A replica in the raft group, and they're distributed to the follower replicas. And they're only accepted when a quorum of the replicas have acknowledged receipts. And quorum is this fancy word, it just means majority, a strict majority. Um, if you're familiar at all with Raft, you're probably saying, hey, it's not the leaseholder. What's a leaseholder? It's really called a leader. And I apologize. There's actually a separate concept inside CockroachDB um, between leader and leaseholder. I'm just gonna be using leaseholder in this webinar. But really, there's two distinct com concepts there. Internally inside CockroachDB, we almost have these, the leader and the leaseholder, they're almost always one in the same replica, though they can diverge, and it's all right for them to diverge for a small period of time. Uh, hopefully, this doesn't confuse you too much. So let me talk a little bit more uh, uh, about how reads occur inside Raft. Now, we introduced this concept of leaseholder, and the purpose of the leaseholder is to make reads faster. So if we didn't have the leaseholder, um, we'd have to do reads um, with consensus. And that would mean in order to do a read, such as a read of the key Carl, you go to the call range, and then you have to talk to all the replicas and find out what the most recent value was for that key. Um, this is, would be expensive. We'd be doing these um, network hops, two, three, four network hops um, for each read. The reads without consensus is that we is the idea that we should be able to just talk to a single replica. Now there's a kind of a, a problem here though, is you can't just talk to any replica in the raft. You have to talk to the one that is kind of knows the up-to-date state, but there is a replica that knows the up-to-date state and that's the one that has coordinated all the rights. And this is the, the leaseholder uh, of the raft group. Um, so that one replica in the raft group that is the leaseholder, it coordinates all, all the rights for the range and then it performs all the reads for the range. <clears throat> 
Um, in addition to doing the rights, um, something I should mention here, uh, which I, I, I'm not going to touch on in this webinar other than right here, is that there, there are other um, benefits to having the leaseholder. This is where some of our um, uh, isolation mechanisms take place, such as uh, key locking um, and something called the timestamp cache, which I won't dive into. And both of these are important for our serializable isolation implementation. All right. So, now I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, the distribution part again. So we talked about breaking the monolithic key space up into ranges. And now we, we, we replicate those ranges. So we have hundreds or thousands of replicas in a cluster. Then we have this you know, problem. Where do we place the replicas in the cluster? And this is the, the, what we call the replica placement problem. Uh, Cockroach TV uses four signals um, to address the re replica placement problem. Uh, space, diversity, uh, load, and latency. Um, I'm going to talk through uh, three of these. I'm going to skip over space-based placement because uh, it can kind of be summed up as we try to bounce the space usage across the, the nodes in the cluster. Um, it's pretty easy. <clears throat> so let me move on and, and talk about diversity-based placement. And uh, the, the purpose of diversity-based placement is that we try to spread uh, replicas across their domains. Uh, as we all know, we've all heard in the news recently, you know, diversity improves teams and companies and it also improves uh, distributed systems. We want a failure uh, of, you know, a disk or a node to not affect the entire range. For that range are not on the same disk and not on the same node, but we also make sure they're not on the, in the same data center and perhaps not in the same country. Um, the, the failure domains, they're kind of determined dynamically uh, within Cockroach TV. There's administrator control over this, um, and Cockroach is simply trying to uh, spread the replicas across as many failure domains as possible while adhering to the constraints that the administrator specifies. <clears throat> so load-based placement um, is, is the next uh, heuristic I'm going to talk about. So you might imagine at a high level that if I just balance the replicas, the space usage across all the nodes in the cluster, that would be sufficient to balance load. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't work as well in practice. Um, so for one, there's kind of an imbalance in the work being performed between uh, the two, uh, two types of replicas. So we have leaseholder replicas that are coordinating the writes and performing all the reads and the follower replicas, which are just performing the writes. And that imbalance, that read imbalance, causes some replicas um, to be you know, kind of uh, they, they use more CPU. They use CPU and network to perform the reads. Um, so we have to, you know, balance the leaseholders um, and take account of the leaseholders and balance those uh, across the nodes in the system. But even that uh, isn't sufficient to balance the load. And the, the way to, to, to think about this is that if you have um, a schema with, you know, uh, one very large table, then maybe a small reference table. That small reference table uh, could be accessed on every query, even though it fits in a single range. Or even if it's a, a small number of ranges, it might get accessed in every query. And the replicas for that small reference table, though the nodes which uh, they reside on are going to be hot nodes. So we want to kind of generally like unload other replicas from those nodes and and actually balance what we see as the you know operations per second that are happening on the replicas across so Peter really quickly so is this doing it dynamically basically as the, the system is running just all the time basically balancing out for load yep it's doing it completely dynamically so the system's measuring the load on each of the, the ranges and then it's taking that into account and saying like ah, I should move this range range a over here and range B over there. Uh, we'll get into the second that you know nodes are coming up and down in the system. You know, it's like we can add a new node. We got to start taking advantage of it. You got to move replicas over to that um, and take advantage of the extra capacity. Cool. All right. So um, the last placement heuristic, heuristic is powered by latency, and this is you know a little bit similar to the load-based one. So Cockroach DB is a Jew distributed. Uh, key value store. It's not just distributed, it's geo-distributed. And when you get that geo part, you have geographic network latencies. And these, those can be significant from tens of milliseconds for short distances to low hundreds of milliseconds uh, for longer hops. Um, it should kind of be clear that it'd be better to access a, a local replica than one that is very far away. And we actually get control where those replicas reside. 
Um, a U.S. user would prefer to have their data in the U.S., and sometimes governments even require this. Um, but we can also do it within the U.S. So if I'm on the West Coast, I would prefer to have my data uh, located in the West Coast. And we don't want the administrator to have to be controlled. This is the, the system just wants to do this automatically. I'm, I'm, you know, I take a weekend trip. I took a weekend trip to, to Napa this past weekend. I want all my data to kind of migrate over for the purpose of the weekend. Um, that's just one example of where like the, 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 the placement decisions can actually change fairly, um, uh, on a fairly short basis within a system. Um, the other one we frequently see in practice uh, is how the load on a system where users are requesting from changes during the course of the day. Um, new sites will see this where the, you know, the East Coast wakes up, they start accessing new sites, you see a lot of activity from the East Coast, and then it, you know, as the sun moves, uh, you know, and the, the day turns, we see the, the workload shift to the center of the country, to the West Coast, and then, you know, dies down again. Um, we actually described the functionality in CockroachDB. Uh, we originally described it as follow the, the sun, but now we describe it as follow the workload because there's other reasons for the, the workload to change in addition to the, the changing time. So before you move on here, and it's related to this concept, Pete, um, because we require le reads to go through the leaseholder, can that affect performance as well because of, of Hobbs and then, you know, the single, single yep. point for, for the read, right? And so how do, we, how do we mitigate that as well? Yeah, so we require the, the reads to go through the leaseholder. So one of the first things that the, the, the follow the workload uh, heuristic does is it tries to move the leaseholder close to where the data right. is being accessed. So, you know, we might be replicating geographically for the rights, but we move the, the leaseholder to, you know, like the West Coast when I'm on the West Coast so my reads are fast. We can also do things like as of system time and do follow rates as well. Yep, right? and you know, applications have to, you know, for reads. Um, but when they do that, then they could also get performance benefits um, without us even moving leaseholder around. That's cool, awesome. All right, so those are the, the kind of the mechanisms and heuristics in. Uh, uh, replica placement. I'm going to just kind of walk through an example of what happens when we add a node. So the, the number of nodes in a cockroach cluster is not fixed at creation time. It's very easy to just, you know, add a new node to the cluster and have the cluster automatically, you know, start rebalancing onto it. So what happens when we add a node? Uh, the existing, the, these replica placement heuristics I talked about from the previous slide start to kick in and the cluster starts selecting replicas and moves them from existing nodes in the system um, over to the new node. Um, I should note here that uh, there isn't really movement in computer science. There is, I copy the, make a copy of the data on the new node, and then I delete it from the old node. And that's exactly what you see here. So move is complete when I, uh, when I delete it. <clears throat> um, the kind of the opposite end uh, from adding a node is, uh, the nodes go away. And this is both, there, there's temporary node failures um, as well as permanent node failures. Here we, we show a node catching on fire. Um, so when a node goes down, uh, the raft groups that have replicas on that node will recognize that the a replica is missing and they'll use exactly the same uh, replica placement heuristics from the previous slide to decide where to create, you know, um, where to create new replicas. <clears throat> So there's two ways that uh, replicas, new replicas can be created. Um, and the, the, the need for these two mechanisms is due to the, the kind of two different types of node failures. We have temporary node failures and permanent node failures. So when a node goes down for a moment, um, rather than sending kind of a full snapshot of that 64 megabytes of data, it's actually much quicker if we can just send the, the, the delta of the commands that happened on that replica, which might be zero, might be very small, or might just be one or two operations. Um, and the leaseholder um, does this, it does this kind of catch up operation. Um, I'm not gonna dive into the details, this is kind of low level in raft. Um, essentially there's this log of operations and we can send that, you know, the, the tail of that log uh, to the repl replicas to catch up. Um, back up one second here though and oops uh the alternative to sending the log is actually sending the entire uh, a snapshot of the entire replica state and you know the the, the reason the trade-off and the decision cockroach db is making is which one's going to be faster all right so let me move on uh we got through distributed replicated key value store i did talk about transactions but i'm going to dive a little bit more into the 
So uh, for any of you who took databases in college, you'll probably remember this term, ACID, uh, atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. Um, there's a lot to talk about all of, of these, uh, these words. I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, just kind of the basic transaction mechanism. I wanna highlight that uh, CockroachDB provides serializable isolation. It's kind of the gold standard of isolation levels. Uh, kind of at like a very high level, you can think of serializable isolation as the intuitive isolation levels. Um, concurrent transactions, they behave as if they were executed in some serial order. Uh, we might not actually know what that serial order is, but that's how each transaction sees the world. Uh, you might think, hey, this sounds a lot like I just like each transaction sees a snapshot of the database, um, but it's more than that because when there actually is overlapping operations between two transactions, um, serializable will recognize that while snapshot won't. And this actually comes up when uh, transactions are doing reads and also writes. Um, if you're only doing write operations, snapshot will be um, uh, very similar to serializable, but sometimes you'll have a serializable transaction that will read a piece of data and someone else will come in um, and, and also do a read and they're both making decisions based on that piece of data that they read. Um, why do you care about the isolation level? Well, a lot of other databases provide weaker isolation levels, and there's actually a lot of evidence that that produces bugs in real systems. Um, some lovely folks out at Stanford wrote this awesome paper uh, a couple years ago called Acid Rain about the pitfalls of weaker isolation levels. I'd highly recommend reading it uh, for more information on this topic. So transactions in CockroachDB, they span arbitrary ranges, and they support a conversational protocol. And what I mean by conversational is that you don't need the full set of operations in a transaction up front. Um, the transaction can start, um, an application can do some reads within a transaction, get the data back from those reads, decide to do some writes, and you know, the application logic can still stay in the application. Um, there's other transaction models and implementations where you have to kind of specify all your transaction logic in one big blob to the database. Um, and that makes the implementation uh, uh, simpler in many ways, um, but also poses a burden in converting your application to, to work with that new model. <clears throat> so I mentioned this before, uh, RAS provides atomic rights to individual ranges. Um, and that atomic write operation is how we bootstrap transactions. Um, essentially, there is a transaction record associated with each transaction, and when we are, when the transaction is um, in progress, it's in this pending state, and then there's this kind of single switch that we flip when we want to commit the transaction that flips the transaction from that pending state to a commit state. You know, in our distributed replicated key value store, uh, flipping that switch is atomic. And it's atomic because uh, RAF writes are atomic. So I'm gonna walk through an example of, of how this works. So here we see a transaction, um, I have kind of pseudo SQL here. We're inserting into our dogs table, um, the, the keys, Sunny and Ozzy. Right, where's my next slide? There we go. Um, so the way this starts, it kind of is decomposed that we, we start our transaction, and then we write the keys sunny. Um, so let me talk through a little bit about what's happening on this slide. When we start uh, the transaction, we actually end up, uh, we create the transaction record on that range containing the keys sunny. Um, and I'm not just I'm showing it in the slide itself, but the transaction record is itself replicated um, to the replicas that are part of that range. We then write the, the key sunny and the key sunny is then, you know, is written to the leaseholder and it's sent along to the follower replicas. One of those replicas will return first and say, um, hey, I'm acknowledging the commit. The leaseholder will also have been writing uh, the key sunny um, on its local replica. And when that happens, the, 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 the data is considered written. But something I, I want to highlight here is notice how that we've, we've highlighted sunny in yellow. Um, the, when a transaction is writing a key, it's kind of tagged that key as being part of the transaction. And that's for two purposes. Another transaction that comes along and sees Sunny at this point, will we'll see that, oh, hey, Sunny's in the act of being written. And I need to go check and see if that transaction is, has been uh, committed or reported. Can I read the value? 
or do I not see it at all? Is it invisible to, to, to my other transaction? So moving on after we wrote Sunny is we write Aussie. And very similar to the write of Sunny, this goes out to the leaseholder for the Aussie range. Um, we send the write there and then the leaseholder for the Aussie range uh, replicates the Aussie key to the followers. One of them replies, and at this point, it launches back to the, the gateway node that is processing the SQL. And um, Aussie is considered written as part of the transaction. And notice again that both Sunny and Aussie are still highlighting yellow, indicating that they're still part of this active transaction. And then we do a commit. And the commit operation, it just flips that you know, switch on the transaction record. And at this point, Sunny and Aussie are both visible to other transactions. Client, and then the, the entire operation is done. So real quickly, Peter, before we go on, yep. um, the gateway itself, that can be basically any node within all of CockroachDB, correct? Yep, yep. Uh, all the nodes within CockroachDB can act as a gateway node and process SQL. No matter where they're at. No matter where they're at. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit later when we get into the SQL implementation about how we actually decompose SQL operations and put some of the execution close, as close to the data as possible. Um, but all the nodes are homogeneous in the, the sense that they can all process the SQL. Um, and the distributed key value layer makes it seem like all the data is local, even if it's distributed in the cluster. Right. And then there was one question about quorum rights as well. Yep. And so to get quorum, we're gonna, how does that work? It's, it's two or three, right? It's two out of three. So it's a majority. So if you have three replicas, you need two. If you have five replicas, uh, you need, uh, three for the, for the quorum. Um, something else that comes up here is sometimes you might have four replicas. In that case, you still need a strict majority. Two is not sufficient. If you have three. four replicas, you need three. Yeah, it, you know, I think it's a little offsetting, I think, because there's only four nodes here. Yeah. And, and yeah, we're, we're filling up these four nodes, but often you'll have like, you know, 15 or 20 nodes. The replica is only written in three different nodes, right? So yeah. I think, you know, it's, it's not that we're filling up a cluster. Yep. I think it's really key to get us to point that one out. So cool. Yep. yep. <clears throat> All right, <clears throat> so what I just described and walked through in the previous slides, um, that was the original transactional protocol CockroachDB implemented, and that protocol was correct. Uh, we've done a bunch of work proving its correctness, and yet, you know, as you saw, it required all these round, raft round trips. Um, those round trips add network latency. And over time, we've steadily been evolving this protocol. So we started with correct, and we started adding performance along the way. Um, so the, the, the current state we're at with our transaction protocol, we call it pipelining. And the, the historic protocol, the original protocol, we call serial. I'm going to kind of walk through um, how pipelining, what we implement now, improves upon the performance of serial. So I'm going to walk through the same example we had before. So we start the transaction and we write the keys sunny. Um, the transaction record is always written to the same range as the first key in the transaction. And the way that's done is we just don't write the transaction record until you see that first write. So with the, the serial implementation, um, the, the operations involve these round trips. So I write the transaction record um, and you know the transaction record is in the pending state and then I wait for the response. And then I write the sunny key and then I wait for the response. With pipeline, we actually just start off writing sunny. Um, and this is a little bit funny, you're like, hey, but the transaction record doesn't exist, what's going on here? Um, it's safe because we give the transaction a small grace window, which a non-existent transaction. And this grace window is just a few seconds. It's not enough to you know, cause any um, harm in the system. And for the most, most of the time, transactions are, are very short-lived. Um, we move on, we write the key Aussie, and in the serial version, we write Aussie, and then we wait for the response and that entire round trip. And something you notice is here we go to, to you know, write Aussie in the pipeline version, and you know, Sunny is still in flight. The Sunny write hasn't finished yet. We're on to writing Aussie. Um, we're just doing these things kind of concurrently. And then we go to commit. So in the serial version, um, we go to commit, and we, we send along uh, here are the keys that were part of the uh, transaction. Um, this actually occurs in both the, the serial and pipeline that the, the transaction knows the keys that were part of the transaction, uh, transaction record does. Um, 
everything's still happening in parallel in the pipeline version. The serial version, the commit's done as soon as that transaction record is written. But the pipeline version is more complicated. The, the commit isn't complete until all the operations that were part of the transaction have committed. But those are all taking place in parallel. And kind of you see this delta T in the time between the serial and the pipeline. This is kind of what we see in practice, which is with the pipelining, um, we actually get this incredible latency savings. Because essentially, we we're having to wait for one round trip of latency um, and not and whatever it is for here that in the serial version. So, so quite a bit of savings. And kind of the conceptual way to think about this is that in the old serial model, um, the commit marker was just the centralized commit marker on the transaction record. And in the pipeline version, we distributed the commit marker um, for someone, another transaction to come in and tell, hey, is this transaction committed or reported? It actually has to do a distributed operation. Those are, you know, those checks are very rare. And it's much better to get the latency savings. Um, as you might imagine, this is all kind of complex. Um, this is about as complex as it gets in um, implementing distributed systems. Uh, we actually uh, modeled our new protocol in uh, using uh, kind of formal methods. We use TLA plus to do this, um, which is kind of nice. Uh, it gives us a lot of confidence that we didn't make a, any egregious mistakes here. I would note that you know formal methods like TLA plus are not a panacea. I mean, there can still be bugs in your system. There can be bugs in your implementation. So this is just one of many tools we have um, for uh, verifying correctness. All right. So that was kind of uh, the the key value layer of CockroachDB. And oh wow, okay, we're a little over halfway through, and I still have a lot to talk about with SQL. So so let's dive into the SQL side of uh, of CockroachDB. So. structured query language. Um, one of the things to note about SQL is it's declarative, not imperative. Uh, as an, an application says, these are the results I, I want and describes the results it wants, but it doesn't describe how to get those results. Um, this is important. This is um, where a lot of the implementation complexity of databases comes in, in that a SQL database has to take that kind of declarative language and transform it to a series of, of imperative operations. Uh, but we think this is best done by the database, not by the application. This is where SQL optimizers play in the world they play in. The other thing to note about um, SQL, um, the structured portion, is that it has schemas. It has tables and rows and columns and uh, the, 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 the values have types like int and float and string. Um, and this is all kind of, you know, seems kind of far away from what I was just talking about with keys and values. So. Uh, I want to actually talk a little bit um, about uh, how we uh, map the tabular data onto key value data. Um, so I want to give you a quick reminder that the keys and values in our distributed replicated transactional key value store are ordered lexicographically. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about how you take a table data and, and map it down to that key value data. So, uh, the examples here are going to talk about this inventory table where it has three columns. We have an ID column, um, which is an integer, a name column, which is a string, and a price column, which is a float. And uh, there's a, uh, the, the ID is the, the primary key. Um, so what I'm showing on the left is just that, that table data. And on the right are the, the keys and values that we translate that row into. So the primary key for a table um, because becomes the key uh, in, in our replicated distributed transactional key value store. So we'll have IDs like one, two, and three. And on the right, they become keys slash one, slash two, slash three. Um, and the values are similar, that we take the, the values, all the value columns, and place them into the value. Uh, I'm just going to kind of ignore the value portion for a little bit. And suffice to say, like, you might be wondering what kind of encoding we use there. We could have used something like protobufs or Avro. Um, the actual coding we use um, is custom, because this is kind of highly performance critical code, um, details aren't super important. Kind of like this, more, the more interesting bit here is how we encode um, the, the columns that are part of the, uh, the primary key into the key. And these are the index columns. And right here in, in this example, there's only one, but there might be multiple. Um, and these are typed. So we have integers, but you know, the keys are strings ordered lexicographically. And on the surface, it seems like, you know, a little bit like this, you know, vast 
Um, you can't see me right now, but I'm waving my hands and saying this is possible to do. Uh, kind of the details are, are fascinating if you're into that. It's very low level. Um, if you ask a question at the end, maybe you, we can uh, put a link into you know, where in the code this is done in CockroachDB. It's a relatively small library. And it's more of that I just want to highlight that this is possible than actually describe how it's possible. Uh, Cockroach DB, Cockroach Labs didn't invent this idea. I first saw it when I was working at Google, but I know Google didn't invent it either. Um, I think I saw a paper in the 80s or 90s which talked about it, but I don't even know if it was invented there. Um, so what I want to mention last on this slide is that when you see uh, the key, it says slash one, slash two, slash three. That's just the, the logical representation I'm giving for the key, um, not actually how the, the key is physically encoded. <clears throat> so, in order to support multiple tables and indexes, we end up prefixing all the keys and we prefix them with the table name and the index name. So, in this case, we prefix it with, you know, slash inventory um, slash primary. Um, this is, again, just the logical view of it. We don't actually store the table names and the index names in the key. Instead, we store integer IDs, and these integer IDs are small. Um, the purpose of this is twofold. Um, the integer IDs are smaller than the names, and they allow us to also perform fast rename operations. <clears throat> now, what happens if I add another index on this table? So here I'm showing adding a name index, and um, it's an index on the name column. Um, so something I should point out here uh, is that you see the keys that are generated for this, for this uh, uh, name index, and there's more than one column store there. We have bat, and then we also have the ID. And you might on the being like, well, what's going on here? I thought I would just have bat, and ball, and glove. Where's the slash one, slash two, slash three coming from? And the purpose of that is that this is a non-unique index. I can have duplicate values in this index, and that um, suffix there, uh, which is the ID column, is used to provide uniqueness. Why did we use the ID column? Because we need every, every table has some form of uniqueness associated with each row. Um, you either give it the, the, the table a primary key, which defines those unique set of columns, or if you don't give it a, um, a primary key, CockroachDB will automatically create one behind the scenes. So what happens if I was to add another row? Um, we're selling a, another bat. We have two um, items in our inventory table, both with the name of the bat with different prices. Uh, what this looks like when we convert it into our um, key is that we get a bat, but now it has an idea of four. And this distinguishes the two bats. Um, apologies, something I just noticed right here in this slide is that really these should be sorted um, lexicographically, and they're not. Uh, so uh, SQL is it about more than just the tabular data storage. You know, it's also this incredibly powerful query language. And CockroachDB is a full SQL database. Um, we're not partial SQL. We got, we got all the whole kit and caboodle. You got the transactions and indexes and foreign keys, and you also have joins and aggregations. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about SQL execution and then finish with uh, query optimization. So th there's a, actually a relatively small number of SQL operations. Um, there's projection. Uh, where you, you know, select which columns you want in the result. There's selection, uh, where you just, you know, filter the, the rows that are returned. Um, you have aggregation, where you can do a group by across a set of columns. There's joins and other kind of set operations. Um, you can scan from the, the base relations, uh, scan from tables. And there's also sorting, um, the order by operation, which is technically not a relational operator, if anybody out there wants to be pedantic, but please kind of describe in the set of uh, relational operators. Um, all the relational operators, uh, they have input expressions except for the base scan, um, and there's scalar expressions associated with this. And I'm just kind of giving you a flavor of, uh, of what's taking place here in SQL execution over the next couple of slides, um, where I think on the surface, when I first got into dealing with SQL execution, you think there's magical stuff going on beyond on behind the scenes, and really there's just a, a heck of a lot of bookkeeping taking place. So a query plan is just a tree of these relational expressions. Um, and SQL execution, what it does is it takes a query plan and runs operations to completion. Where does the query plan come from? Well, that's what SQL optimization does, and I'll get into that in the uh, last part of this webinar. So I'm gonna walk through a simple example of SQL execution to, to show you what it looks like. So here's a query, we're um, scanning the inventory table, 
and I'm selecting all the inventory items with names that are uh, essentially start with the letter B. So the, the first part of SQL execution is we're doing a scan and we're doing a scan of the inventory table, which is uh, described by this uh, green box here. Um, the output from that scan, why didn't that advance? Oh, sometimes it advances two slides. Okay, the output from that um, scan is, is passed into um, the filter expression. And the filter takes those rows from the scan and just only allows through the ones where we have names, you know, that start with the letter B. And then finally, um, we did the scan and we actually were passing through um, uh, all the columns at that point. We were passing through the ID column, the name column, the price column, if there were any other columns in the tables. The final part is we do a project operation and we project out the name column. And those results are there. Um, we kind of noticed something here that this is kind of the, the, the naive way to implement this query. And this is where SQL optimization comes in where there's a whole bunch of different transformations we can do here to make this more, query more efficient um, to, to execute. And when I, when I talk about that efficiency, I'm talking about it at the uh, kind of logical level. Um, one of the first you should note is that if there's an index on name, like we had in our um, uh, example earlier, that we shouldn't actually scan the entire table. A full table scan is very ex expensive. So we can actually push the filter right down into uh, the scan and then scan just a subset. And this is also tying back into why we um, wanted uh, this kind of um, full ordering of all our keys in the system, because the, the rows here might be spread across multiple ranges and the scan operation will still be able to, to find them efficiently. Um, so we do the scan, we do the project um, still, and we get the results. And this execution um, is much quicker uh, than the previous one. So it's kind of a, two primary challenges when it comes to SQL execution. Uh, the first is correctness, of course. You can't return the wrong results or uh, developers get mad, users get mad. Um, and the, the challenge with correctness is that, you know, there's user-defined schemas and there's just a ton of generality involved in SQL execution. Um, a lot of bookkeeping that takes place behind the scenes in order to make it work. Um, and there's also some semantics that are kind of tricky to implement. Um, the biggest you know, headache for almost all SQL execution engines is handling of nulls. I'm not gonna talk about it today. It's too large a topic to touch on, but pretty much every database implementer will have encountered um, the headaches of the, the semantics of null handling. Um, so the other challenge is performance. And performance is this huge concern because we want our results to be returned quickly. Uh, kind of three general tactics, performance tactics we have. Um, one is just tight, well-written code. You don't do extraneous operations. Um, the second is specialized operators. And I'm actually gonna talk about that in a second. And the last is distributed execution. Um, so far, what I've been describing, it could have all been taking place on a single machine. But if we have a distributed you know, SQL database, we wanna be distributing um, the execution. So let me talk about um, the operator specialization for a little bit. Oops. Here we go. Uh, um, I'm going to give you a, an example of a specialization of the group by operator. So here's a, here's a query where we're, you know, scanning the customer's table, we're grouping the results by country, and then we're uh, counting up the number of users um, per, per country. Now, uh, normal, the, the kind of the general form of group by is something that's called um, hash group by, where we create an in-memory map of uh, Um, blue uh, rows represent uh, users in the United States or customers in the United States. Uh, the red uh, indicate customers in France and green indicates customers in Germany. So there's this in-memory map that the, the hash group by is, is generating. And this map can actually be you know, somewhat sizable. But as we walk through the input rows, we're going to be updating this map. So I start with a United States user and that adds an entry to the, the output map. I move on, I see a German user, then we see a France user, and we're just incrementing these counts as we go. We see another um, user from France, and that um, increments the count to two. We see a, a user from the United States, and we're done. And this is the kind of the, 
the output of the group by operator. So something you should note here is that we kind of have buffer up all the results in memory. Um, and then we also have this hash table. So, so this map is implemented as a hash table. And you know, we all know hash tables are, are fast. And you might be thinking, what kind of specialization can I do here that could be faster than using a hash table? Um, you know, it's kind of like, you know, big O uh, of one, you know, constant time operation to um, look up a value in a hash table. And the answer is to not have a hash table at all. <clears throat> so how do we get rid of having a hash table? Well, I'm going to do a real kind of quick transformation of the input data. What happens if all the input data was actually sorted by country? So here I've just reordered the data. It's the exact same data, but now we have all the data, you know, we sorted by the country first. And what you can see is all the groups kind of, you know, became contiguous. Now, if we walk through this um, same data set again, we can see that we're just having to keep track of a single group at a time. As soon as we get to the end of the French users and move on to the German users, we could output the, that France row um, as a result. The same thing happens. We move from the German users to the United States users, and we're only having to keep track of a single result at a time. Um, this is uh, you know, internally called the streaming group by operator, and it requires the input to be um, sorted on the grouping column. You know, doing that sorting is going to be as expensive or more expensive than generating a hash table, but oftentimes, uh, that, that, that um, sorting will come out naturally from another part of the query or because there's an index on country that allows the data to already be sorted. Um, and again, that's uh, the SQL optimizer's job is to find out when that there, it's a, there's a possibility of using one of these specialized operators. So let me move on to distributed SQL execution. Um, as I talked about before, uh, we're just geo-distributed database. And important considerations in geo distributed set setups. I've been talking about SQL execution as if it's all happening on a single node, but we want to kind of decompose the SQL operation and push the fragments as close to the data as possible. So I'm going to revisit um, this ongoing example with doing a, uh, you know, counting the customers by country. And if our data was actually, you know, distributed geographically such that we had, you know, some users on the west coast of the US and some on the east coast and some over in Europe, some of that data, what I actually want to do is kind of decompose the SQL execution so that I'm doing local group by operations next to the data. And then the, the reason for doing this is rather than, you know, sending like, you know, kind of a, a large table with your data um, centrally to, to, to execute a group by on, I'm just doing like the group by locally, which is really fast. And then what I send over the network is actually a small count of data um, of, of the number of users on the, you know, West Coast and East Coast and in Europe, and I, you know, that, that does get centralized on the gateway uh, for final aggregation. So, Peter, there's a lot more complexity under distributed SQL <laughs> execution, right? I'm sure, like, yeah. there's a couple of guys rolling their eyes right now yeah. that are sitting about 50 yards from us, right? Yeah, um, there is a ton more complexity here. This is just the like kind of the very simplest example of this. So, we distribute the group buys, we distribute joins, figuring out how to do that distribution. Um, but it's one of the big differences of, of what we're doing. I mean, yeah, we built basically huge. a SQL execution engine from the ground up. We aren't like piggybacking off of, you know, what's already there in Postgres. We, we actually had to build it yeah. from the ground up because you, this you, is truly distributed. Yeah, this is truly distributed. We're trying to, you know, like we have to decompose that query into parts that can be distributed and which parts can't be distributed. Um, yeah. yeah, this is a huge technical challenge. <laughs> that's an that's a hour long in itself. Yeah, <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I covered it in, um, Two minutes, right? Cool. So, yeah, sufficient. <laughs> uh, all right. So, let me move on with the final part of this uh, webinar, which is talking about SQL optimization. So, I've kind of hinted about this already, but I'm just going to kind of walk you through the, the high-level phases of of executing a SQL query. So, we we've you know SQL query comes in and it's text, and in order to you know execute the query, we have to parse it. And the output of parsing is what's called an abstract syntax tree. Um, the abstract AST is sent into this, um, uh, the next phase, which is called prep and, you know, short for prepare. So we prepare the query. And what takes place is we do this series of um, uh, kind of annotations on the syntax tree. We, we fold constants, we check types, we resolve names so that we have those, you know, uh, you know, a name of a table like inventory and we translate that into, we verify the ID, we re re uh, retrieve the schema for the table, et cetera. 
we compute various um, properties that are used by opti the optimizer, um, statistics, and then there's also cost-independent transformations. And some of those I mentioned above, you know, folding constants is an example of a cost-independent transformation. Um, the output of prep is this extremely cool data structure called a memo, which I unfortunately do not have time to talk about in depth today. Um, just kind of fantastic data structure. Um, and a memo data structure is set in something, um, it's called the search phase. And search is where we're kind of exploring this vast space of possible ways to execute a SQL query and deciding on the best one. And during the search phase is where cost-based transformations come in. Um, and the output of the search phase is we select the, the, the query plan from one of dozens or hundreds or potentially even thousands of query plans that we think has the best, is gonna be the fastest to ex execute. And then that's sent to SQL execution to execute. So let me talk a little bit about cost independent transformations. I'm gonna talk about you know, one cost independent transformation, then um, we'll, we'll see an example of cost-based transformation. So some transformations just kind of always make sense. You always wanna do them to your query. If you have two constants you're adding together, you always wanna add them together before executing the query because it makes no sense to you know, uh, keep on, you know, perform that you know, constant operation again and again for each row in the query. Um, another example is pushing down filters. Um, we, we saw this earlier uh, in, in one of our examples. Um, and lastly, there's decorrelating subqueries. Um, correlated subqueries are this kind of vast and fascinating topic, um, but usually you want to decorrelate them in order to execute them because it's much, much faster. Um, we describe these as cost independent transformations because they're always applied to the query. Um, we actually uh, wrote this, created this domain specific language for these transformations. Um, this DSL is compiled down to code, which efficiently matches um, fragments of the query stored in the memo um, and then performs the transformation. And currently we have a little over 200 transformations um, defined in the system. <clears throat> um, so let me talk about one of the, the cost independent transformations and this is filter pushdown. Um, I'm gonna do a slightly more complex example than what I described earlier, which is here we have a, a, a query which is doing a join on two tables and I have a filter afterward. And the kind of initial plan that you create from the AST um, shows us doing a scan of the two tables, we do a join, and then we do a filter operation to send the results. Um, filter pushdown is the observation that if we actually have the filter and can be applied to both sides of the join, it's better to push it push under the join. The join is a fairly expensive operation and um, the expense of the operation is dependent on how many rows are being sent into it. And if we can reduce the number of rows, it's a good thing to do. It's always a good thing to do. Um, so we always try to push down filters. Um, this is described as filter push down, not filter push left, because the way these things are usually um, visualized is that the root of the query tree happens on top and then the, the leaves are at the bottom. Um, in these slides, I have you know, kind of the root on the right and the leaves on the left, um, just kind of ro rotate everything in your mind. Um, Cost-based transformations. These are transformations which are not universally good. And you know, the kind of two canonical examples of this are index selection and join reordering. Um, the transformations are cost-based because we don't know if we should apply it or not. And so you say, what should we do then? How do you make that decision? Um, we actually do both. We, we, we keep the uh, query without the transformation applied and we keep it with applied. And this kind of creates a state explosion. You get thousands of query plans um, due to this. And it's the memo structure that really comes to the rescue here, which the memo structure allows us to represent, you know, hundreds of thousands of these alternate queries in a very compact uh, data structure. Um, we estimate the cost of each query and then we select the one with the lowest cost. Um, costing is this kind of deep and vast topic as well, which I'm not gonna get into. Um, just a short bullet here that we do costing based on table statistics. So we actually look at your table data, we scan it um, ahead of time and, and cache away statistics about it. Um, that allow us to estimate the cardinality of the table and histograms about uh, the value distribution. So, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit uh, just shortly about cost-based index selection. Uh, the index you use for the query is actually affected by a whole number of factors. Which filters and join conditions are part of the query, if there's a required ordering such as an order by, if there's an implicit ordering such as a group by, which would allow us to you know, choose the streaming group by operator. Um, if the index um, actually has all the, the columns that are needed for the query, 
um, meaning it's a covering index versus a non-covering index, meaning that I'm going to have to look up rows in the index and then look up the, the, the main row in the main table, um, and also locality, which I'll talk about last. So let's uh, go back and see an example of how the, the index selection um, comes into play. So uh, here's an example of a required ordering affecting index selection. The, the naive plan for this query on the left is I do a scan of the table A, I do the filter, and I do a sort. But there's another option. I could push down the filter into the scan, and then I can do the sort. You might think, well, yeah, you know, filter push down is good. Shouldn't I always do this? Well, not necessarily. There's another option, which is if we have an index on Y, it might be better to scan Y. And we get the ordering, and we filter, and then there's no sort. Now, which one of these do I want to choose? Well, I'm going to ignore the top one for now. And on the table and the filtering, there's only 10 rows that go from the scan into the sort. Now, sorting, you know, we know, and log in um, kind of runtime for this stuff. It's, it's, it's fast. Um, so if there's a few number of, of tables, uh, a few number of rows, this is actually probably the lowest cost plan. Um, versus, you know, let's say the table had, you know, total 100,000 um, rows in it. I'd much rather um, do this, you know, push the filter into the scan operation um, and do the sort than do the, you know, have the sort happen and then have to do this filter on 100,000 rows. Um, but there's an alternative which is uh, the filter might not actually be very selective. And in this case, the, the scan operation um, with the filter outputs 50,000 rows, and then I have to sort 50,000 rows. And that actually is going to turn out to be much more expensive than just having the, the sort occur naturally by scanning on the, the Y index. All right, that was a super quick example of a cost-based um, uh, transformation. Um, but we have another one, which is locality-aware SQL optimization. Optimization. And coming back again to this topic of you know, network latencies and throughput, they're just important considerations in geo-distributed setups. Um, one of the extensions we have to SQL is that we allow um, indexes and table data uh, to be duplicated. And this is not, you know, this is expensive to do on the right side, but if you have read mostly data, um, it can actually provide a very, very significant performance improvement. So, if we have this kind of read mostly data that is replicated in multiple localities, we can actually plan queries to use the local data. Um, so here I'm giving an example of, we have a postal codes table and I've actually just, there's three indexes on this table, the primary key index, um, an index in Europe and an index in um, US West. And we use replication constraints um, that we can pin the copies to different geographics regions. And I described it here as pinning data to US East, US West, and Europe. So we have three indexes, but the replicas for those indexes are stored um, in three separate areas. All the data is exactly the same. <clears throat> the optimizer includes, includes locality in, into its cost model, and it automatically selects the index from the same localities where the query is executing. So if I actually do a select star from the postal codes table and it sends this to the, you know, nodes in the US West region, it'll be like, oh, do I actually have any, you know, do I have data here in the US West region that I can use? And if I do, um, it's going to do the query just entirely locally and avoid any geographic network crops. Again, unique to a distributed database. Right? Unique yeah. to a distributed database. Yeah, it's it's interesting. So there's multiple kind of levels at which we're taking locality into effect. We're, you know, trying to move replicas close to being where they're accessed, but we're also giving the administrator some control over this as well. Yeah, that's cool. Unique. Yep. Uh, that was whirlwind. Um, so let me just do a, a kind of quick review of where we were. At the low level, there's a distributed replicated transactional key value store, um, which exposes a model to the key space. Um, our key space is divided into you know, ranges, approximately 64 megabytes. And remember, replication occurs at the range level. Um, we use a whole bunch of signals. Um, for deciding where replicas go, uh, space, diversity, load, and latency. Um, transactions are pipelined to um, reduce the impact of network round trips. Um, we have this layer that maps all this, uh, you know, the, the structured SQL data, tables and columns um, in, in typed values down onto the key value storage. And we have a distributed SQL execution um, that kind of takes advantage of the distributed nature of the data. Um, as well as a distributed SQL optimizer, which 
um, works to both do kind of classic optimization techniques as well as take um, advantage of our distributed SQL execution engine. Awesome. Um, thank you, Peter. That, that was that was a fantastic overview and a crazy deep dive. And I forgive everybody for going over seven minutes, but I'm gonna I'm gonna blame it on my questions and me going on at the very beginning. So, um, but we did try to answer a lot of the questions that we got in the chat along the way. I'm gonna forego the the chat questions for now. I know there were a couple that were there, guys. Um, we will um, um, answer those uh, post event. We'll we'll send you an email as we do with every every email or every webinar. But again, thank you, Peter. Yeah. Did you have fun? I love going over this shit. I know, I know you do. So <laughs> I love listening to it. So, all right, great. Thanks everybody. Um, one last thing before I do go, um, you know, we just talked about kind of what is this, right? And the architecture of it. And our next webinar actually on August 8th will be why you use this stuff. Uh, and so it's more kind of the, 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 the tactical of, of how this is used in applications and, and, and what are the certain scenarios in which you would actually use a distributed SQL database. And so that will be our next webinar. Um, the link is there, it's live on our website now. We would love to have you join us for that. And then my last commercial is we are putting on a conference here in New York City, October 16th. Um, not about cockroach slabs or not about distributed SQL in particular, but all the challenges that people have with uh, running things in multiple clouds. I think one of the unique capabilities of, of cockroach is that we actually, we could span a database because each node is a consistent gateway to the whole thing. We, we could span a database across multiple different clouds. And, and so we're going to get, get a lot of practitioners together to talk about the challenges around multi-clouds. So with that, um, I thank everybody for joining us today. Um, there is a survey that's been placed into the chat window that, uh, that Charlotte placed in the chat window. If you could please do, um, you know, uh, answer that for us, we, we would like to get better. I know there are a few little, uh, there, there's some audio issues throughout the way. Um, we'll get a clean recording of this out to everybody. Uh, we apologize for that, but uh, I do hope you enjoyed the wonderful rest of the day. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good one. All right. Thank you. Bye.